Good morning, friends. Hope you're all doing great. Today we shall be starting with VAT, which is Value Added Tax. I'm pretty sure all of you must have heard of the term VAT. We all pay VAT in India as well. So applicably, we are going to look at UK VAT. So all the rules, all the genres that are applicable to UK VAT. So let's have a look at what is UK VAT, how it is applied, and what are the areas on which you need to pay. VAT. So what is the scope of VAT to begin with? VAT is effectively what? It's a consumer expenditure tax. So every time a consumer is spending, they have to pay VAT on it. So it is basically called a consumer expenditure tax, but is collected from businesses at each stage of the supply chain management, which very simply means let me open up my notepad for you, right? Which very simply means, supposingly there is a manufacturer of some car parts. This manufacturer would supply the particular car parts to the dealer, which is, which is going to be the car dealer. Now this car dealer is the one who is going to sell it off to the ultimate consumers like you and me. So consumer like you and me. So what basically happens in each stage of this supply chain management, VAT is collected. So VAT is collected by the manufacturer, by the car dealer, by the consumer. And the VAT is ultimately paid by who cannot recover the VAT which they have paid. So till then, the manufacturer, the car dealer, they would also be able to reclaim the amount of VAT that they have paid as a part of input VAT. However, the final consumer is the one who going, who is going to bear the VAT. Thus, what basically means that he cannot recover VAT. Apart from the ultimate consumer, everybody else in the supply chain management is able to recover the VAT amount. So VAT is added at each stage on sales, which is known as output tax, with each supplier receiving credit for VAT paid on acquisition. So whatever you've paid on your purchases, you can claim an input VAT, which is known as what you have paid and you can charge a output VAT on whatever you are selling off until the tax that is output tax is ultimately borne by the final consumer who is unable to recover the tax paid. So very simply in each stage of the supply chain management, whatever you are charging, you are able to claim back whatever you have paid as VAT as well. That is known as input VAT because you can charge an output VAT and then you settle your liability by netting off your output charge, reduce your input charge and net off and then you only need to pay off the balance. The standard rate of VAT which is applicable to you currently is 20%. The tax is administered by HMRC which basically means that HMRC is the one who is going to be collecting the VAT and is the tax authority also for VAT purposes. Let's quickly understand this with the help of an illustration. Pretty much similar to what we had already done, just put down some numbers to it. So VAT mechanics, the tax operates as follows. Manufacturer, so there is a manufacturer who is making a car component and sells to a car dealer. The price for which it is selling is 80 pounds plus VAT which is 20% of your sale price so thus 20% of 80. Now the selling price becomes 96. So the car dealer has ultimately Bone how much car dealer has basically shelled out 96 pounds from its pocket, 80 towards the price of the car, car component and 16 pounds towards the VAT component. So 80 plus 16. Now this car dealer is the one who will be ultimately selling it off to the final customer, the final consumer. 
supposingly is going to sell it off for 120 pounds on this 120 pounds is also going to levy the appropriate vat which is 20 percent of 120 thus the selling price comes out to be 144 so very simply what has happened for this car dealer he is charged 24 pounds as vat and he's paid 16 pounds as VAT input so that he can reduce and pay the balance 8 to the HMRC. What happens to the remaining 16? It is charged by the manufacturer who is going to pay 16 to the VAT department and the consumer is ultimately shelling off the total 24 pounds from his pocket which the consumer cannot recover in any so whatsoever manner so similarly simply what happens that the VAT amount is ultimately borne by the, uh, fi the final customer in between that the final bin between the interim stages what happens basically each of these stages they are able to recover the amount of tax they have paid on their acquisitions known as input VAT they only pay the balance to the HMRC. So this gets paid by the manufacturer to HMRC. This gets paid by the car dealer to HMRC. But the entire total 24 is borne by the ultimate customer who is not able to recover any part of this tax which has been levied upon him. So very simply these are the basic rules of VAT. Now let's have a look at general definition of VAT to start off with which basically means that VAT is charged on a taxable supply of goods and services made by a taxable person where the supply is either made in the UK in the course of business undertaken in the UK and import into the UK from a country outside the EU or an acquisition from other countries within the EU. So three very important things we're going to talk about here. We're going to talk about taxable supplies of what? Of goods and services being made by a taxable person. So what do we have to look for? We have to look for taxable supply of goods and services by taxable person. So what is the genre of this VAT? Anything that gets manufactured in the UK definitely becomes liable to UK VAT. Any import that comes from outside the world, from the rest of the world into the UK again liable to UK VAT. So anything that comes in from the rest of the world into the UK again liable for UK VAT. Also apart from UK and rest of the world we have somewhere which is known as a European Union which is not exactly part of the UK but it is not forming part of the rest of the world as well. So anything that comes in which is known as an acquisition from an EU country into the UK will also be known as subject to UK VAT. So these are the basic genres broadly which we can talk about when we're talking about UK VAT being applicable on goods. So any goods basically that is manufactured imported in UK from rest of the world or any acquisition made in the UK acquisition in UK from any of the European Union countries all subject to pay UK VAT so this is very broadly the genre of UK VAT Let's get back to the rules, right? So now let's start with each of these terminologies one by one. What is a taxable supply to start off with? 
taxable supplies or taxable supply is any supply other than an exempt supply or one which is outside the scope of VAT. So very simply everything will be known as a taxable supply. Everything is a taxable supply unless it is clearly an exempt supply or it is clearly outside the scope of UK VAT. So very simply this is what is known as a taxable supply. So all liable to UK VAT. So what is an exempt supply to begin with? Exempt supplies are supplies specifically identified as not being taxable supplies which basically means that they are specifically identified as an exempt supply. Now what is the repercussion of being an exempt supply? It's basically that no output VAT is added to such a supply and no input VAT also on acquisitions can be recovered on these exempt supplies. So what is the repercussion? No output VAT and no recovery of input VAT as well. So very simply what do we have? These are the repercussions with respect to an exempt supply. Now what is outside the scope of UK VAT? Let's have a look at the applicable rules for it. Outside the scope supplies are supplies which are not exempt supplies but which were never treated as a supply for VAT purposes. Very simply why? Because it's always outside the scope of a UK VAT. So something that has never even fallen into the genre of UK VAT. Although no output tax arises on such a supply, related input tax is still recoverable. So no output VAT but you can recover your input tax VAT. So very simply there is no output VAT but you can recover input VAT on any supply which is outside the scope of UK VAT. So let's have a look at what is a taxable supply more. Right. So taxable supplies are basically of the following three types. First being a zero rated supply. So the first taxable supply can be categorized unless obviously they are exempt or outside the scope of UK VAT. They are going to be of three types. The first applicable rate is a zero rated taxable supply. The second being reduced rate supplies and the third being a standard rated supply. So what are these three? Let's have a look at them. Can you quickly grab some water please? Right. So zero rated supplies are very clearly the ones on which you're going to charge VAT at the applicable rate of 0%. So they are basically a nil rate supply. Reduced supply rate, rate of supply basically means that the applicable VAT is 5%. However, in our examination point of view, in this F6 syllabus, a reduced rate of supply will never be examined. So just for knowledge purpose, you should know that there are three types, nil, reduced, which is 5% and then the standard rated 20%. But from exams point of view, this reduced rate of 5% will never be examined. So taxable supplies that are charged at 5%, standard rated is obviously the standard rate, which is 20%. So all other supplies which are taxed at 20%. So what do we have? So we now have taxable supplies. Unless they are exempt 
or they are outside the scope of VAT. They are of three types. Zero rated, reduced rated and standard rated. Redu zero rated is obviously 0%, reduced rate is 5% and standard rated is 20%. So this is what we know so far. What else input tax related to all taxable supplies is recoverable. So you can recover your input VAT on all of these different genres of applicable VAT. The level of taxable supplies determines whether or not a person is required to register for VAT. So now we know that there is some threshold level we, which, we, which, we will, we, which we will be looking at which is going to determine whether or not you are under the threshold to register for VAT or not. So what do we know? What are? Let's have a look at each of these we have done in detail now. The first being an exempt supply. So let's have a look at what are exempt supplies for VAT purposes. Land and building with various exceptions, financial services, educational services, including vocational training provided by non-profit making bodies, health and welfare services provided by government or other bodies on a non-profit making basis, the supply of goods or services by charities for charitable fundraising events. All of these are exempt supplies for the purpose of VAT. You need not remember the entire list by, by genres. Why? Because the examiner will tell you whether or not it is an exempt supply, zero rated supply or what sort of a category of a supply it is. So basically just for knowledge you should know these are the types of exempt supplies for the purpose of VAT. What about supplies that would be considered outside the scope of VAT at large? So the transfer of goods arising from a business being sold or otherwise transferred as a going concern. So any goods being transferred as a going concern when the business gets sold off would be considered outside the scope of UK VAT, which means when a business gets transferred from one entity to the other as a going concern, there would be no output VAT charged. Certain gifts of goods and services, exports of services to all customers located in countries not within the EU. Very simply, when you are exporting services, to any customer who is situated in the rest of the world the place of supply will always be considered where the service is basically delivered so would be the rest of the world so very simply the UK VAT it doesn't obviously fall in the gamut of UK VAT. Why? Because the place of the supply of the service is outside the scope of UK VAT. Why? Because it is in the rest of the world. Now that we know these, can we start with the three main genres of taxable supplies that we have? The first being zero rated supply. So what is a zero rated supply for VAT purposes? The exports of goods including related transport costs to all customers located in countries not within the EU will always be considered a zero rated supply. Food for human consumption excluding food provided in the course of catering Hot takeaway, confectionery, beverages and snacks, which are all standard rating. Definitely all of these are standard rating. You pay VAT at applicable 20%. Pet foods, sewerage services, books and newspapers, printed music and maps, new residential land and buildings. All of these would be considered at a nil percentage. They are all zero rated supply from a VAT point of view. What else? Transport of people by any vehicle 
for 10 or more passengers. Travel services where travel destination is outside the EU air navigation, port pilotage, salvage and towage service, repair and maintenance services of ships and aircrafts, lifeboat and sea rescue services, drugs, medicines and aids for handicapped people, specified supplies of goods to or by charities, children, clothing and footwear. They are all zero rated supplies which very simply means that they are charged at an applicable VAT rate of 0%. Now that we know this, let's have a look at what is a, who is basically a taxable person who is going to pay VAT liability. Let me quickly grab some water please. Right. So taxable person to start off with is any individual, company or partnership making or intending to make taxable supplies and required to be registered for VAT. So two things we are looking at, any person, any char any company, any taxable, any partnership may be a taxable person as long as they are making a taxable supply and is registered for UK VAT. So two things we have to look for, making a taxable supply, taxable, what are taxable supplies we've already done and also need to be registered for VAT. So let's now have a look at what is this registration need? What is the threshold limit of being registered for VAT purposes and what is the threshold limit for getting deregistered from VAT? So very simply, if it is the person who is registered, that is there is one purpose for, there is one person for one purpose who gets registered for VAT purposes. It is not the business who gets registered. Does a person's registration would cover all his business activities, howsoever diverse they may be in itself. So now let's have a look at what is the registration limit and what is the applicable deregistration limit. So registration limit to start off with, we need to have, we need to understand that being registered for VAT purposes is going to be of two types. The first being a compulsory registration. After compulsory registration, you can also voluntarily opt to register yourself for VAT even though you are not required by law to register for VAT. So that is known as a voluntary registration. So two types of registrations can be there for UK VAT purposes, compulsory as well as Voluntary. Let's have a look at what are the applicable requirements for compulsory registration. Compulsory registration is required if at the end of any month taxable supplies in the last 12 months or lesser period have exceeded 81,000 pounds is the threshold limit which you need to fulfill, bear with me, there's something wrong here. It is actually 83,000 pounds now. Read this as 83,000 pounds, please. Right. So taxable supplies, just bear with me quickly. Let me check whether I have the recent file on me or not. Bear with me one second, please. Right, let me quickly open up the most recent file as well so that there is no confusion. I seems to be having the older version today on me.
Right, so very simply, I now have the Let me quickly check that this is the recent file. No, this is still the older version. Something is definitely wrong here. Right. So I'll keep making the applicable changes, don't worry. Right. So please read this as eighty three thousand pounds. Right. So what do we have? We need to compulsorily register for VAT if at the end of any month we know that in the previous 12 months so we are going back in time. So this is known as the historical test. The supply of VAT needs to have, it needs to have exceeded the threshold limit of 83,000 pounds which is known as the historical test or if we can go ahead in time under the future prospects test, we know that at any time in the future, we know that this threshold limit is going to be crossed, which is the applicable 83,000 pounds in the next 30 days. So at any time, taxable supplies in the next 30 days are expected to exceed the threshold limit of 83,000 pounds. So very simply, what do we have here? For compulsory registration, you need to qualify one of these two tests. The historical test, which means in the previous 12 months, the taxable supplies need to exceed the threshold limit of 83,000 pounds. Or in the future prospect test, you're going ahead in time, the next 30 days, your taxable supplies you know that are going to exceed the threshold limit of 83,000 pounds. In any of these matters, you need to compulsorily register for VAT. So very simply, this is the compulsory registration limit. Now, in order to calculate this taxable supplies, you're going to include zero rated supplies, but you cannot obviously include any supplies for capital goods for VAT purposes. But remember that you need to include your zero rated supplies as well when you're calculating your threshold limit of 83,000 pounds being surpassed or not. Now what it is basically the potentially taxable person must notify the HMRC of the need to register within 30 days of the end of the month in which the turnover limit was exceeded. So within the 30 days of your historical test, you need to register yourself of the end of the month, 30 days from the end of the month, which means that supposedly in May, I have surpassed my limit in the previous 12 months, then end of May, 30 days from May, so 30th of June, I must register for VAT. By the end of the 30 days period during which the future prospect test will be satisfied. So this is historical, second is future. By the end of the 30 days period during which the future prospect test I know is going to be satisfied. So I must compulsorily register for VAT. Effective date of registration would be considered for the historical test. The effective date of registration would be from the end of the month following after the limit is exceeded and for the future prospect test from the date the grounds first existed. So the very day I now realize 
that in the next 30 days my future prospect test is going to be qualified this very day today itself is going to be my effective date of registration for VAT purposes HMRC will not register HMRC will not register if value of taxable supplies in the month in the one year beginning the proposed date of registration is less than 81,000 pounds which is your annual deregistration limit. So if this limit is below the applicable 81,000 pounds which is the threshold for deregistration you need not register yourself. So very simply what do we have? These are the threshold limit for registration. The threshold limit for deregistration is 81,000 pounds. So very simply this is what we know so far. So now let's have a look at a few examples so that we better understand all these applicable dates. What to include, what not to include. So let's have a look at example 1. Compulsory registration. Mr. Tom opened a shop on the 1st of January 2016 selling books. Now books are zero rated and stationery stationery is standard rated. In the year ended 31st of December 2016, sales of stationery were 3,800 a month and sales of books were 1,000 a month. Remember, in order to calculate your taxable supplies, you have to take both zero rated as well as taxable supplies. So means the, the entire year total was 3,800 plus 1,000. 4,800 per month for the year ended 31st of December 2016. So 4,800 multiplied by 12. How much does it come out to be? 4,800 multiplied by 12 is 57,600 definitely which is less than the applicable threshold limit of 83,000 pounds. Does you still have not surpassed the compulsory registration requirement during the first few months of the year ended 31st of December 2017 the business expanded and sales were as follows January total of 9200 February 11600 March 15100 April 15100 May 16200 for the rest of the year Sales remained at their May 2017 levels. You are required to determine the latest date by when Mr. Tom is required to notify HMRC of the need to register for VAT and the date off from which the registration will be effective. So we need to calculate under the historical test when is it that you are surpassing the threshold limit of 83,000 pounds when you need to compulsorily register for VAT. So till 31st of December 2016, <coughs> let me quickly grab some water please. Right. So till 20, 31st of December 2016, I have not surpassed my threshold level. How about January 16, January 17. Let's have a look at what is the applicable sales volume as at January. So 31st of January. Bear with me. Thirty first of January twenty seventeen. What is the taxable supply? I'm calculating taxable supplies. It is going to be how much? January I did how much? Nine thousand two hundred plus eleven months from the previous year. Each month has been 4,800 multiplied by 
11. So very simply, my taxable supplies are 82, 62,000 pounds. What is it? Let me again tell you. Let me grab my pen as well. Right. So what it is I'm looking at here? I'm looking at January plus the preceding years, 11 months. Why? Because I have to look at the previous 12 months. So 4,800 multiplied by 11 plus January taxable supplies I have checked. Now let's go back and do it the next month onwards which is 28th of February 2017. How much are my taxable supplies are going to be equals to this is February this 9200 is January and from the previous year I am going to take 10 months so 4800 multiply by 10 68800 again not surpass the basic threshold limit right let's go the next month which is March 31st of March 2017 I'm now going to take March which is how much 15,100 plus Feb 11,600 plus January which is 9,200 plus from the previous year I'm going to take how many months 7 more months so which means 4,800 multiply by 7 is what I'm going to take 65, 90, sorry, 69,500 still not surpass the basic threshold limit. Sorry, I'm taking the incorrect number of months. This is going to be 3, 9 more months. Right, 79,100. Now come April, what it is? April is 30th of April 2017. I'm going to take taxable supplies of April, which is 15,100. March, 15,100. February, 11,600. January, 9,200. Plus another 8 months from the previous year, which is now 4,800 multiply by 8 months right so 89,400 I have surpassed my threshold limit of 83,000 pounds so 30th of April 2017 I know I am going to surpass so what is going to be my I must register by when latest date to register is going to be 30 days from the end of the month in which you will have surpassed. So end of the month is 30th April. 30 days from there is going to be 30th of May 2017. And the effective date of registration the effective date of registration is going to be the next day there on which is going to be the 1st of June 2017 is going to be my effective date of registration of VAT purpose. So very simply this is what we have when we are looking at the historic test for VAT purposes. Now let's have a look at another example. So Mr. Smart started a clothing manufacturing business on the 1st of July 2016. In the first three months, turnover of taxable supplies was 10,000 to 10, 10, 10, 30,000 in the first three months. On 3rd of October 2016, he received an order for 80,000 pounds of clothing for delivery by 31st of October 2016. So come to think of it, as soon as on the 3rd of October, you've received this order of 80,000 pounds, you know that your taxable supplies are going to exceed in the next 30 days under the future prospect test. So you must register for VAT. So let's have a look at under both genres 
first historical test and then future prospect test what is going to be the applicable date and what is it that we are going to follow right so first let's do it under the future prospects test why future prospects test first because i know that in the next 30 days my taxable supplies are going to exceed 83000 pounds of threshold limit so what should i do as so in the next 30 days i must register so which basically means when do i know what is the latest date of registration and what will be the effective date of registration under the future prospect test and under the historic test right so under the future prospect test on the 3rd of october 2017 i know that in the next 30 days i am going to surpass my threshold limit so what it is within the date of when you as soon as you realize within the next 30 days you must get registered so by 2nd of november 2017 you must get registered which is 30 days from the date of realization which is the 3rd of october the day when you receive your order 30 days from that day you must register for vat the effective date of registration is going to be the very day when you realize that you are going to surpass your threshold limit so the 3rd of october is your effective date of registration for vat purposes what about historic test under historic test you're going back in time so by when you haven't surpassed your 30 or 83000 limit definitely you haven't surpassed it until the 31st of october until the 31st of october within the next 30 days you must register so by when by the 30th of november 2017 you must register for vat purposes under the historic test and the very next day is your effective date of registration which is the 1st of december 2017 so definitely this is what are my applicable dates i am going to follow my future prospect test because it results into an earlier vat registration thus i can start recovering my input vat as well from this earlier date so it's always better to register for vat at a at the earliest possible date right now what are the effects if i do not actually get myself registered within these applicable time frames definitely you do not know you do not do something which was required by the tax authority you will be levied penalties and interest upon you so results in penalties for incorrect returns and the need to collect vat retrospectively so there is no escaping even if you have not registered you are going to be now liable to pay vat from a retrospective effect let me grab some water please right from a retrospective effect which means you will be going back in time penalties are going to range from 30% to 100% of the unpaid tax which is output minus input for the period between the date of the person should have registered to the date of actual registration you will be required to pay penalties penalties which can be ranging from a 30% to as grave as 100% of the amount but could be less if the taxpayer makes an unprompted disclosure which means without being asked by the hmrc you may have just skipped being registered for vat and you now up yourself go up to the hmrc and ask for registration so in this case definitely the penalty is going to be lesser that is why i say that the penalties range from 30% to as grave as 100% of the penalty what about compulsory registration we've done till now rules for 
compulsory registration now let's have a look at voluntary registration which means even though you haven't fulfilled any of these tests historical or future still voluntarily you want to opt for register for registering for VAT purposes now under what circumstances do you reckon it will be better for me as an organization to register myself for VAT purposes definitely when I know at as when I start my business that in the new near future I am eventually going to be surpassing this threshold limit of 83,000 pounds I so I might as well register myself now rather than doing monthly checks after the end of every month under your historic test or under your future you're going to keep on calculating so just to save on that time and money and extra effort let's just get ourselves registered straight away why because eventually yes I am going to be liable to be registered for compulsory registration or what else do you think can be the scenario wherein you would want to register yourself voluntarily for VAT. Definitely a scenario wherein what is happening, you are able to recover your input tax. So supposingly you are making zero rated supplies on which you would want to recover your input tax. You would want to basically register compels, you would want to register voluntarily rather than waiting for the threshold limit to be surpassed. Why? Because it obviously eases your own cash inflow. Bear with me a second. Right. So a potentially taxable person may voluntarily register for VAT without first satisfying the turnover test provided that taxable supplies are being made or intended to be made. Definitely that definitely needs to be done. What are the advantages of it? Now come to think of it, you are going to a shop which doesn't charge VAT. Why? Because it is not yet surpassed the threshold limit. What impression will you get of that shop? Definitely that it's a small setup. They've literally just started. So you know that you are going to into a sh small shop. Some organizations would want to hide this small image of their business. Why? Because it doesn't give them a larger businesses outlook. So definitely I would want to get myself voluntarily registered for VAT, charge VAT and give it to the HMRC. Why? Because nothing is going out of my own pocket. I'm just going to take tax from people and pay it to the HMRC. Why? Because it hides the small size of the business allows trader to recover input VAT from an earlier date. This is particularly advantageous if the business is likely to recover VAT than it pays. Why? Because there is a potentially zero rated supplier. Allows all potentially taxable suppliers to improve their claims for input tax on pre-registration expenditures and also definitely are going to avoid penalties being levied for late registration why because you're actually opting in for early registration you're voluntarily registering yourself for VAT however every pros has its cons as well what are the apparent disadvantages of getting yourself voluntarily registered Disadvantages are going to include extra administration cost. If customers are not VAT registered, that is cannot recover VAT charge to them. The trader may have to absorb VAT to remain competitive, which very simply means, come to think of it, you are a small shop, shop A, and there is also another shop, shop B, selling the same things. Now shop A is registered for VAT and shop B still has not registered for VAT. Why? Because they have not surpassed the threshold limit. Now as a customer, anything say worth 100 pounds that you want to buy will be sold by shop A at 100 plus 20% and at shop B for 100 pounds right so definitely as a customer where would you want to go you would want to go into shop b and buy it for straight 
hundred pounds. However, in order to remain in order to remain competitive, let's have a look at it at the other way round. I can buy something for from shop B at hundred pounds. Why will I go to shop A to buy the same thing? So what shopkeeper A has to do? He has to absorb this VAT himself, which means he himself is the one who is going to deposit this VAT to the HMRC in order to make your selling price same as the non-VAT registered entity. So in order to remain yourself competitive, you will have to absorb this VAT yourself. So very simply, this is what it means that this is definitely a disadvantage to customers who have customers in turn who have got other options to go and buy at non-VAT registered businesses. Exemptions from registration would follow. A person may wholly or mainly zero rated supplies may apply for exemption from registration just to be able to save on the extra administration cost but definitely loses what? Loses the ability to reclaim input VAT. Why? Because you are voluntarily asking the, uh, the HMRC to exempt you from VAT registration. Now similarly Similarly, what is the deregistration limit? A taxable supplier may voluntarily deregister if the value of taxable supplies in the next 12 months will be 81,000 pounds or less. Registration is cancelled from the date of request itself. A taxable supplier who ceases to make taxable supplies must compulsorily deregister HMRC, must be notified within 30 days of doing so. Registration will be cancelled from the date of cessation. Why? Because you know that you have basically ceased to make this taxable supply or you have basically fallen below the deregistration limit which is 81,000 pounds. Also on deregistration the VAT return for the final tax period ending with deregistration must include output VAT on all the assets of the business on which input tax relief was claimed and which was still owned at the close of the business on the last date of registration. Because you've claimed input VAT on it you now need to compulsory deposit output VAT on it as well even though they have not been sold out to the customers but in order to close your accounts of VAT you must pay your relevant output VAT as well. Output VAT on goods held at deregistration and taken for personal use must also be accounted for and not however if the value of these goods is less than thousand pounds. So upon ceasing to trade business any goods for personal use which I am taking out definitely yes I am going to pay my relevant output VAT on it as well. Alright now let's have a look at a scenario wherein there is a transfer of a business as a going concern. So from one person to the other, the business is just basically changing the owner's name. There is a transfer of the business happening as a going concern itself. So what happens under these circumstances? Compulsory deregistration applies where a business is sold or otherwise transferred as a going concern to new owners. Such transfers will inevitably involve assets falling within the scope of VAT. Why? Because you are transferring business as a going concern. So definitely some of your taxable supplies are going to be the one which are applicable for VAT purposes as well. However, subject to fulfillment of conditions, this transaction will be treated as a supply outside the scope of VAT. Remember when we did 
let me show you the sheet again right outside the scope of vat if the transfer of goods arising from a business being sold to otherwise transfer or otherwise transferred as a going concern so when we are selling of business as a going concern they are considered as a supply outside the scope of vat so let's have a look at the applicable rules for it let me quickly grab back to the sheet right so compulsory deregistration applies where a business is sold or otherwise transferred as a going concern to new businesses however subject to fulfillment bear with me a second right so it's come back so however subject to fulfillment of conditions put the charging please subject to fulfillment of conditions this transaction will be treated as a supply outside the scope of vat output tax applies to all assets transferred by vendor which in turn is going to denies the input tax recovery to the purchaser the conditions of which being the business is transferred as a going concern there is no significant break in trading the same type of business is being carried on after the transfer and the new owner is or will be registered for vat purposes so basically everything remains the same just the owner changes from mr a to mr b instead where the new owner is not already registered for vat what he can opt to do is that he can opt to take the vat number of the previous owner as well even that can be done however the only drawback of doing this is that the with the vat number also comes the vat history of that number so if it's a bad history as a new owner you would not want to take on a bad vat history on your own self why because the entire number changes to yourself which means now it it will be presumed that it was always owned by you only now there is another concept which is known as group vat which very simply means that instead of company a why is my pen not working why 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 so basically i need to look at why let me just start writing it here only so let's can let's consider a scenario where in what we have we are looking at group companies so company a let me just open up an excel instead so what do we have we have company a and we also have company b it's okay i'll work on excel right so what do we have we have company a and we have company b both are forming part of a group of companies individually company a needs to register for vat company b needs to register for vat however what happens when company a and company b both form part of a group of companies which basically means that company a owns company b so now they are forming part of a group company let's let's just broaden our scenario a little bit apart from company b company a also owns say company c so now i'm looking at a scenario 
wherein there is one parent company company A which is owning company B and company C as well. So let's have a look at what happens when they are a group company and what happens when they register for VAT as a group as a whole. So under normal VAT rules each limited company is a separate taxable person and should if making taxable supplies in excess of the registration limit of 83,000 pounds per year be separately registered for VAT. However, for practical reasons, a group of companies under common ownership can apply for a single registration covering all companies in the group. So what is now happening? Company A, B, C are not going to separately register for VAT individually. Why? Instead, one group member acts as a representative of the group and takes on the VAT registration on behalf of the entire group, calculates the VAT liability of the entire group and also settles the VAT liability of the entire group. So instead of three entities now being registered for VAT, we only have any one company, say company B is the one who gets registered for VAT, calculates VAT liability and also settles the requisite VAT liability. Right, so now we know that we are going to look at a group of companies. Let me go to grab some water. Right. So definition of a group for VAT purposes means what a VAT group company comprises two or more companies established or having a fixed establishment in the UK and subject to common control by a single parent and individual, individual or individuals in partnership for business purposes. Control is 50% control. So very simply what do we have? As long as Miss Company A owns at least 50% owns at least 50% of Company B and 50% of Company C they will all be considered one group for VAT purposes. A group VAT can comprise both UK resident and foreign resident companies operating in the UK. Companies may be either taxable or exempt suppliers from VAT purposes. So any company as long as it forms part of a group can register for UK VAT as a group VAT instead. So what are the effects of registering yourself as a group? An application for group registration has immediate effect although HMRC has 90 days in which to deny or modify the application. One VAT return is submitted for the whole group for each tax period which simply means that company A, company B, company C can now file in one single VAT return for the entire group as a whole. So they can set off their VAT liabilities amongst themselves whatever be the net amount only that needs to be submitted to the HMRC. Why? Because we are preparing one VAT return for the entire group. One company not necessarily the parent company acts as the representative member responsible for administering the VAT for the group. So like I told you, any one company, be it A, B or C, like I told company B in this case, anyone can act as a representative for VAT. So be it A, B, 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 C, regardless of the fact that who is a subsidiary company and who is a so a holding company, any of them can act as a VAT representative. However, all companies remain jointly and severally liable 
for the group VAT liability. Definitely your liability as a group will always be your liability jointly and severally. So what are the apparent advantages of registering for a group membership? Under group registration rules, group is deemed to be one legal entity and intercompany rules, the group is deemed to be one legal entity and intercompany transactions are outside the scope of VAT. Which very simply means that if goods are being transferred within the group from A to B, B to C, C to B, C to A, neither of these transactions will be applicable for VAT because they will be considered one single entity, they are a group. So all these transactions, all these intra-company transactions are considered outside the scope of UK VAT. So you can happily transfer goods from one company to the other without being liable to pay VAT. So that is definitely one advantage. Although registration should be, should include all the group companies, individual companies can be left out. Why do you think it would be advantageous for me to leave out an individual company? Definitely one example of this could be when this one particular company is making a zero rated taxable supply. So I am not charging anything but I can recover my VAT inputs on a monthly basis rather than netting off my liability on a group basis. So although the registration should include all the rich companies, group companies, individual companies can be left out of the group registration if it would be disadvantageous to include this them in the group. For example, a zero rated supplier can be omitted to ensure that monthly cash refunds are received by that company as opposed to having recoverable VAT offset against output tax from the rest of the group on a quarterly basis. So what I would want, I would rather recover my monthly on a monthly basis my VAT input if I'm making a zero rated supply rather than being forming part of a group and then setting off or netting off my VAT liability as a group as a whole on a quarterly basis. Let's quickly do example three. Right, so what do we have here? Let me quickly grab some water please. Right. So Adams PLC owns 80% of the ordinary share capital of both Cox Limited and Hales Limited. The sales of, let me just draw it for you simultaneously. So Adams is holding 80% of Cox and 80% of Hales. Both are more than 50%. So definitely A, C and H, Adams, Cox and Hales all form part of a group for VAT purposes as well. The sales of Adams are standard rated. So this is making standard rated sales while those of Cox and Hales are zero rated. So sales are zero rated. The sales and purchases for the year ended 31st of December 2016 are as follows. Sales and purchases are given to us. Sales of Cox and Hales are zero rated, we already know. Purchases on the other hand are all standard rated. The purchases of all three companies are standard rating. So you can have input VAT on all of these purchases. Sales only Adams is going to be at 20%. Rest are zero rated. Purchases, all of them are standard rated at 20%. Additionally, Adams PLC incurred standard rated OAKS overhead expenditures of 300,000 which cannot be directly attributable to the sales of any of these three companies. So you can basically, these are expenditures, so you can basically definitely claim your input VAT on it as well. So 300,000 you can again claim your input VAT at 
20 percent. Adams also charges each of its subsidiary companies an annual management charge of 40,000 pounds in respect of the services of its accountancy department. All of the above figures are exclusive of VAT where applicable. Adams PLC and its two subsidiaries are not currently registered as a group for VAT purposes. So, when you required assuming the, the group VAT registration does not apply, calculate the VAT position of each of the companies and the overall VAT liability for the year ended 31st of December 2016. Identify the conditions that must be met for Adams PLC and its two subsidiaries to register as a group for VAT purposes and the consequences of being so registered. So very simply, you need to identify what is it the advantages of being registered as a group or if it's better to leave out any of the subsidiaries for not being registered as a group. So what do we have so far? Let's calculate these. We have sales for each of these companies. Let me just write. So let me just sum it up here. So you're all able to see the question as well along with the answer. Right. So what do we have? We have Adams, we have Cox and we have Hales. We are going to first begin with the Output VAT which is on sales. Sales is how much? This multiply by 20% is going to be sales. Sorry, I'm just going to put in the figures first and then calculate it once. Right. Cox, my sales are 540. I'm just jotting down the question as of now. I'm not calculating VAT, just jotting down the sales and the relevant other outputs. The other output is going to be the management charge, which is going to be 40 from Cox and 40 from Hales. So it is going to be 40,000 plus 40,000. This 40 and 40 is going to be input for Cox and Hale. So 40 and 40. Right. So what are my totals? Right. So these are my total outputs on which I can charge my output VAT. Output VAT Adams is standard rated. So I can charge this at standard rate which is 20%. Now these are zero rated. Thus my applicable rate comes out to be 0%. So they come out to be nil. Similarly, Hales as well is zero rated. So I'm going to charge at 0% which again comes out to be zero. So now that I've done my output, calculate my input which is now going to be on first being purchases. Purchases of Adams are, let me refer to the question. Cox, remember all of your purchases are standard rated. Right. Apart from this, you've also got on your Overheads you've included and now you also are going to get what it is 300,000 Adams has also paid as overheads. So 300,000 is Adams overheads as well. So how much does it come out to be? Let's do your totals. Right, so now that I know my totals, can I calculate my input VAT on it, which is applicable at 
all are standard rated so relevant input vat now that i have done this let's calculate the net liability for each of these companies individually so adams has charged 250 can claim 156 as input still needs to pay 94000 similarly cox did not charge anything can claim back 62000 so is input vat that i'm going to recover back from the hmrc by why because they are zero rated supply so they cannot charge anything they can only recover on their inputs now this is individually as companies what happens if they register as a group your group vat liability becomes what becomes your net vat liability which is negative six thousand pounds oops what have i done right so this is equals to six thousand pounds i still need to this is going to be my overall liability which i still need to pay to the hmrc right so very simply this is my overall group's liability now let's have a look at what happens when they register instead of registering as a group they leave out on their zero rated suppliers cox and let me grab my pen their zero rated suppliers cox and hale so what will happen every month they will be able to recover 62,000 pounds from the HMRC and 38,000 pounds for hails from the HMRC. Why? Because they are a zero rated supply. So definitely it will be beneficial for Cox and Hales to deregister from being part of the group itself and start recovering their input VAT every month from the HMRC. So very simply, this is how it is. Now let's have a look at the basic rules for recovery of input tax. Right. So how can I recover my input tax back from the HMRC? Basic rules are going to include that the claimant must be a taxable supplier, including a supplier of zero rated goods and services. The input is evidenced by a tax invoice. Definitely you should be a zero rated supplier. You need to have a valid invoice in order to claim on your purchases. Recovery is not specifically blocked. The input is either purchased in the course of business in the UK or acquired from another country in the EU. All input tax on purchases of goods and services acquired by traders making wholly exempt supplies is always a recoverable remember when we were doing the rules what did we do that for your taxable supplies which were of two types the first being your exempt supplies you could not charge output VAT and you could not recover input VAT as well. However, on your supplies which are outside the scope of VAT, UK VAT, there is no output VAT and you are also not, but you can recover your input VAT. So we are here right now, we are talking about exempt supplies. It becomes irrecoverable if it's a zero, if it's an exempt supply. You cannot recover your input tax as well. So irrecoverable input tax, input VAT on certain expenditures made by registered taxable persons 
ट्रेडर कैन बी नेवर बी रिक्लेम दिस इज रेफर टू एज ब्लॉक्ड और इ रिकवरेबल सो दू कैन नॉट बेसिकली क्लेम इट बैक एवर इट्स अ रिकवरेबल और अ ब्लॉक्ड इनपुट वी ए टी इ रिकवरेबल इनपुट वी ए टी एक्सपेंडिचर दर गोइंग टू इंक्लूड वॉट द वैल्यू ऑफ गुड्स एंड सर्विसेज विद ड्रॉन फ्रॉम द बिजनेस फॉर नॉन बिजनेस पर्पसेज एंडलेस आउटपुट टैक्स इज अकाउंटेड फॉर ऑन प्राइवेट यूज ऑल्सो न्यू कार्स एंड एक्स्ट्रा इक्विपमेंट परचेज विद इन द कार विद द कार अनलेस द कार्स आर आइदर यूज फॉर अ कार बेस्ड बिजनेस और अदरवाइज यूज होल्ली फॉर बिजनेस पर्पसेज हाउ एवर वेर न्यू कार इज लीज एंड ऑल्सो यूज पार्टली फॉर प्राइवेट पर्पसेज फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द इनपुट टैक्स बिकम्स irrecoverable entertaining except for staff and foreign customers disallowed input tax on revenue expenditures will be deductible expense for inheritance tax and corporation tax purposes disallowed input tax on capital items qualifying for capital allowances will rank as part of the cost for capital allowance purposes so even the you or you cannot recover your input tax in other genres of tax be it inheritance tax be it con corporation tax you are basically able to recover this back what about pre registration expenditure now after having been registered for vat i can now claim back all my purchases as my input tax but can i go back forever in time definitely not there would be an applicable time frame which you can go back in time in order to recover your input tax so where expenditure is incurred before registration input tax is recoverable in respect of goods that is inventory and non current assets acquired not more than 4 years back in time okay you are allowed to go back and recover your input tax prior to registration and sold or used in the business after registration and for business services rendered in the 6 months period prior to registration so very simply for my just right so very simply what i have for my pre registration what about the relevant input tax on goods i can go back in time as long as 4 years for goods which are eventually sold after registration for services i can only go back in time the previous 6 months and recover my input vat on these services so very simply these are the applicable rules for pre registration expenditure now that we've done all of this very important that we need to understand what is the place of supply now where is to charge the output vat where is this supply basically taking place for goods as well as for services purposes we need to understand what is the place of supply to charge where are you going to charge your output tax the general rule is that for goods the country in which the trader making the supply is registered for vat so for wherever your goods are being manufactured that is your relevant place of supply of the goods however for services wherever these services are being received will be considered the place of supply of the services so for services the country where the customer receiving the supply is registered for vat is where you are going to charge vat so very very simply what do we have we have the general rules for goods and for services these rules are significantly important in deciding the tax treatment of exports and imports because we need to know what is the particular place where the supply is going to be considered that is the place you where you are going to charge your applicable vat so very simply what do we have place of supply let 
me check if my journal is working. No, oh, something is lost. Let me open up another journal quickly once. Just check it once if it's working. If not, I will leave it. Right. Right. So what is the place of supply for goods? Wherever your goods are manufactured will be considered the place of supply for these goods. What about services? Services would be considered wherever they are delivered. So if any service is being supplied in India from the UK, the place of supply is going to be India. Thus, UK VAT will definitely not apply. Why? Because the place of supply of this particular service is outside the scope of UK VAT. That is why the place of supply for goods and services is extremely important. We need to understand what is the exact place of supply. This exact place of supply is where you're going to charge your applicable VAT. Right. But what is the tax value of supply? Now that we know the place of supply, let's understand what is going to be the applicable value, what is going to be the tax value of supply. Generally, the tax value is the sale price of goods and services. But note that special rules for gifts and items withdrawn from a business for personal use are going to be there. The tax value is after deducting trade discounts that is any bulk discounts that there is you always need to reduce them first supposingly the value was thousand pounds on which you've earned a discount of say 200 pounds on the remaining 800 pounds you're going to add the applicable VAT so always after your trade discount where a cash discount is given for prompt payment VAT is based on the value assuming that the maximum cash discount has been taken. So let's have a look at an illustration to better understand this. Invoice is issued for 1000 pounds plus VAT. A 2% discount is offered for payment within 30 days. So what it is, how much are you going to charge? On 1000 pounds, you're going to reduce your 2% discount first. So 2% discount comes out to be how much? 2% of 1000 pounds twenty pounds is my discount the remaining becomes 980 on which I am now going to charge VAT at 20% which is going to be 100 and 96 pounds is the amount of VAT I charge. So simply it is very simple that this is the amount of VAT that is going to be charged. Now let's presume that the customer does actually pay this on time. So thus he is going to be charged 196 pounds is VAT. If not what happens definitely on your entire thousand pounds you're going to be paying VAT at 20% which is up now 200 pounds instead. So instead of 200 pounds VAT, VAT is going to be 196 pounds if there is any applicable bulk discount or any discount which is relevant. Now extremely important is that we understand the time of supply which means what is the time at which the supply has taken place. We already know the place of supply for goods it is where they are manufactured, for services it is where they are delivered but what is going to be the point of time the tax point where you're going to consider what where the supply has basically taken place the time of supply that is the tax point the tax point is the date of supply it is used to decide in which return period a transaction falls and the rate of VAT applicable so definitely your VAT rates may change. Your tax period in which you need to account for this transaction is going to depend upon the time of supply of the goods and services. 
So first thing we need to understand is the basic tax point. The basic tax point is the legally correct tax point and applies as follows. For supplies of goods generally would be when the goods are dispatched to the customer. So whenever the goods are dispatched to the, good, to the customer, that date of dispatch is going to be considered the basic tax point. For supply of services, definitely whenever these services are going to be performed, that is going to be your basic tax point for services. When goods supplied on a sale or return basis, which means that they are not sales effectively on the date of dispatch. Why? Because they can effectively come back as well. The earlier of the goods when are adopted or 12 months after a dispatch, they will be presumed to have been adopted. So the earlier of the two is going to be considered for goods supplied on a sale or return basis. For goods supplied through vending machine, it is going to be whenever your vending machine is actually emptied is going to be considered your time of supply for the vending machine. So extremely important that you understand these basic tax point. Let me quickly reiterate them for you. The basic tax point for goods is when? Whenever these goods are dispatched to the customer. For services, whenever these services are performed. What about sales on a return basis? So the earlier of either when the goods have actually been adopted, that is they are no, going, no longer going to come back to you. So when adopted, or the maximum you are going to wait is 12 months after dispatch when it will be presumed to have been adopted by the customer. And what about your vending machines? Whenever your vending machine is emptied, that is when it is going to be considered the basic tax point of supply. So these are the point of time wherein you are going to consider the goods or the supply being having made. Apart from the basic tax point, we are also going to consider one actual tax point. Right. So what is your Actual tax point, for accounting purposes, the invoice date or the payment date if earlier, so if payment date is earlier than that, is used in place of basic tax point provided it either precedes or falls within 14 days after the basic tax point. So what do we have? We now have a basic tax point. Instead of taking the basic tax point, you're going to take your invoice date as your actual tax point if the date of invoice precedes or falls in a, uh, or is concluded by within 14 days before or after the date of basic tax point. In that case, you can take your invoice date as your actual tax point just to make accounting more convenient for you okay within 14 days before or after the basic tax point the invoice has been raised for ease of administration you can take the date of invoice as your actual tax point as well also supposingly payment was made before if the payment has already been received then definitely this is what becomes your actual tax point so instead of basic we use the actual tax point provided this these are these conditions are being fulfilled the same rail applies to continuous supply so the tax point will be the issuer issue date of the invoice or the payment date if earlier. 
very simply let's have a look at an example to better understand this i'll make a time always always make a timeline in this scenario so that you know what which date is falling where and where do you need to actually tax your goods what is going to be the exact point of tax of your supply so during the quarter in the 30th of september 2017 mr stone sold a bulk order of stationery amounting to 1000 pounds excluding vat the customer had paid a deposit of 100 pounds on the 12th of july 2017 when he placed the order so very simply what it is let's make a timeline on the 12th of july 2017 you receive an order and also receive 100 pounds advance and this order needs to be submitted needs to be deposited when you need to place your order on the 1st of september the stationery was collected so 1st of september 2017 you have delivered the goods the stationery was issued on the 1st of september and mr dom issued an invoice on the 1st of October 2017 the invoice was issued the remaining 900 pounds were paid on the 8th of October 2017 you received the remaining 900 pounds very simply what is your basic tax point the basic tax point is the time frame when you actually deliver the goods so that is your basic tax point now instead of taking this basic tax point you can use your actual tax point providing the date of the invoice is within 14 days from the delivery date before and after your delivery date now this means 15 days prior or 15 days after had you issued the invoice you could have taken the date of invoice as your actual point but because that has not happened you're not going to take this as your invoice is your actual tax point it is going to be considered 1st of september for the basic tax point however the other exception to the actual tax point was when you actually received the money this 100 pounds was actually received on the 12th of july 2017 itself so for 100 pounds you're going to take 12th of july 2017 as the actual tax point for the remaining 900 pounds you can use your basic tax point as your actual tax point why because this is basically not within for 15 days before or after the date of invoice so this cannot be used and also this is at a later stage so the basic tax point is what is going to be considered for the remaining 900 pounds as the time of supply of the goods simply what do we need to take we first calculate the basic tax point which is the date of the delivery instead of this we take the actual date which is going to be two out of the two first being if you received any advance earlier than this basic date then use that so we use 100 pounds as the actual delivery date for 100 pounds or if the date of invoice you can use as your actual delivery as your actual point if it falls within the 14 days before or after the actual delivery date which in this case does not fulfill what next do we have what happens in case of goods gifts of goods and services so instead of using goods and services instead of selling goods and services and thus charging vat i have gifted away the goods and services definitely the goods have been gifted away but the applicable vat needs to be applied on it which means where a person where a gift of goods and services is made for non business use or for personal reasons the supply is still going to be considered a taxable supply that is output vat must be paid and also you can recover your relevant input vat unless one of these exceptions applies so the exceptions to which is that the gift is a business free sample then definitely you cannot charge vat on it the gift is of goods then the value is small which is 50 pounds per person excluding vat in a 12 month period even if you've given away 
fair enough do not charge output vat on this gift or if the gift is two of goods held at a time of deregistration and taken over for personal use by the proprietor and the value doesn't exceed the 1000 pounds limit which we have already done apart from this all gifts will be you will be charging output vat and also claiming input vat on it unless there is an exemption to it the exceptions we have clearly categorized as these are the only three exceptions applicable to it also where goods and and business services are removed from the business for personal use and the taxable supplies arise the tax values for output vat purposes is going to be as follows so now goods are being used for personal use again definitely you need to charge an output vat on it for goods except for road fuel you're going to take the tax value of the cost of replacement goods for business services tax value is the cost of services to the business so very simply what it is the tax value is the cost of services to the business is what you're going to take except for road fuel so what are the applicable rules for road fuels let's have a look at what are the applicable rules for road fuels then for road fuels for road fuel is provided free of charge by the business for private use of employees or self employed proprietors the tax value of output vat purposes is a scale charge for each tax period so instead of using the actual cost you have to use a scale charge the applicable scale charge will also be given to you in the exam just remember that you have to use the scale charge for road fuel for private use instead of the normal charge which is given to you so the examiner can just try and test you whether your applicability of rules is crisp or not it will give you normal outputs vat as in gifts of goods and will also include road fuel so make sure that for road fuel you are using the applicable scale charge which also would be given to you in accordance with the general rule accounting for the output tax on road fuel per permits the business to reclaim the input vat on the private business use both for private as well as for business purposes where the full cost of private use fuel is charged to the employee the business can reclaim the input vat but accounts for output vat on the charge to the employee which is definitely going to be at the scale charges provided there is some business use the full amount of input vat can be claimed for repairs and similar expenses other motor expenses are only permitted if for business purposes so could require pro rating as well so similarly the rules remain the same as long as you know you remember that for road fuel purposes you're going to use the scale charge now one very important thing i want to tell you now supposingly the cost of the goods is 100 pounds the applicable vat rate is 20 percent of 100 which comes out to be 20 does your VAT inclusive amount comes out to be 120. So if at any point of time in the question the examiner can trick you by not providing you this 100 figure which is a VAT exclusive amount but providing you a VAT inclusive amount instead and then you have to calculate the applicable VAT on it which very simply becomes what? If the 120 figure is given to you, you need to calculate your VAT in the VAT fraction which is going to be 20 upon 20 upon 120 which very simply means 1 by 6 is your applicable VAT fraction. So very simply make sure that you know this little point why because the examiner may try to trick you, may try to test your knowledge by checking out whether or not you know the difference between VAT exclusive figures and the difference between VAT inclusive figures. So if at any point of time 
Here given VAT inclusive figures, make sure you are using the VAT fraction which is 1 by 6. Now let's have a look at an example which is example 5. During the three months ending 31st of December 2017, Mr. Tom's purchases of books amounted to 500 pounds and his stationery and his purchases of stationery is came to come out to pay at 10,340 pounds including VAT. Remember I told you that the examiner may try to trick you sometimes by giving you VAT inclusive figures. Other expenses all standard rated are total 846 again including VAT. So what do we have? Let's refer back to example 1. Books are zero rated and stationery is standard rated. Books are zero rated and stationery is standard rated. Right. Included in other expenses is 300 pounds again including VAT in respect of petrol for Mr. Tom's car. Now remember this is petrol, this is fuel. Instead of using this fuel, you're going to apply what? You're going to apply the appropriate scale charge on it. So his sales remained at constant level. Books are zero rated for VAT. The appropriate quarterly VAT inclusive scale charge for CO2 emissions is 433. So instead of using 300 pounds, you're going to use the applicable scale charge, which is 433 pounds. So very simply make sure you know your rules so that you're very simply able to calculate your output tax and your input tax liabilities. So output tax, let's start with. Output VAT is going to be applicable on what? On stationery only. Why? Because books are zero rated. So now how much do I have? The amount is how much for stationery? What month am I into? I am into month. The month of stationery is applicable. Rate is, let me get back to the question. Three months to December and the 31st of December, I am looking at what levels of stationery. I am this, the question one clearly said that the, for the remaining sales, sales, for the remaining year sales remained at May 27, 17 level. So the applicable stationery level is 13,000. Books are zero rated, which is 3,200. So what happens here? 13,000 sales I have made. For 3 months, the relevant VAT on which is 20%. So, 7,800. Also, output VAT I am going to charge on fuel private, privately used. Remember, I am not going to use the 300 pounds figure given, but the scale charge which is 433 pounds. Now, this 433 pounds is VAT inclusive figure. I need to filter out my VAT amount, which is definitely going to be multiplied by the VAT fraction is what I need to take it at. So, 72 is what I can take. Also, now I need to calculate my relevant input cost, input VAT, which comes out to be what? Input VAT. First on stationery, stationery is how much stationery is given to me at 10,340. Again, this figure is a VAT inclusive figure, which I again need to multiply with the applicable VAT fraction, which is 1 by 6 in order to calculate the VAT amount, which comes out to be 1723 and also on my expenses given expenses given are 846 including VAT. So again 846 multiply by the VAT fraction comes out to be 141. Thus my net VAT liability comes out to be how much? My net VAT liability is output plus output 
reduce from it input reduce from it input comes out to be 6008 point pounds that is going to be my net vat liability so the remember always use what use your scale charge for private use of road fuel road fuel for private purpose and any vat inclusive figure which i have been given filter out the relevant vat by multiplying with the relevant vat fraction which is 20 by 120 which comes out to be 1 by 6 now let's have a look at bad debt relief basically which is going to conclude today's session we've done quite a lot in the next session we're going to do with majorly about exports and imports acquisitions and purchases so to conclude today's session bad debt relief if a business makes credit sales and is not that is obviously not under cash counting scheme vat bad debt relief is given in respect of an impairment cost which basically means that what it is i made a sales on credit basis of 100 pounds added on 20 charged 120 to the customer only charged because these were credit sales i haven't still received these 20 pounds as well what happens when i am already in my next vat return what i do i deposit these 20 pounds to the hmrc right obviously i need to settle my liabilities regardless of the fact whether i have physically received it or not so now what happens when this credit sales of 120 pounds is never actually received by the customer this becomes a bad debt so in my accounting books i am going to write off 100 pounds and also what about this 20 pounds which i have already given to the hmrc i can reclaim it from the hmrc i can basically put in a vat bad debt relief which is very much like an impairment loss with respect to your bad debt for your vat which is gone bad so what are the applicable rules if the business makes credit sales vat bad debt relief is given in respect of impair of an impairment cost if the conditions must be what the debt was written off in accounts obviously must be written off in the books of accounts at least 6 months have elapsed since the later and the date of the date of supply and the due date for payment so after even after 6 months have gone by you've supplied the goods you've not received the payment when 6 months have elapsed have elapsed since your date of supply as well as your due date for payment and what else the tax on the supply has been accounted for and paid to the hmrc definitely you can claim a bad debt relief also the last is that the title must be passed on to the customer at last so if all of these four conditions have been satisfied what you can do you can claim a vat bad debt relief for your sales which you have made on credit but have eventually turned into a bad debt that's it then that brings us to an end of today's session absolutely any query you have please feel free to email it to me at shilpi acca at @gmail.com that's it then thank you very much for today's session thank you